it is a great honour for me to have been invited to present the 2015 CY O'Connor Lecture, not only because I'm relatively new to my role as Vice-Chancellor here at Curtin University, but because of the personal link that I'm sure CY O'Connor had with my great-grandfather, Marmaduke Terry, who was married to Philomena Bussell, a daughter of Alfred and Ellen. Marmaduke was a surveyor and who I understand, amongst other roles, spent a considerable amount of time exploring, surveying and classifying the areas of land around the eastern goldfields and advising on water availability, an issue which, of course, was a major focus for C.Y. O'Connor. Charles Yelverton O'Connor, C.Y. O'Connor, as we've heard, is remembered as a visionary with the persistence, the drive and the technical ability to reshape our state through the creation of physical infrastructure projects of enormous scope. He became the inaugural Engineer-in-Chief of the Public Works Department of Western Australia in 1891. He was responsible, as we've heard, for the construction of Fremantle Harbour, the upgrade and expansion of the state's railway network, and most famously for the Goldfields Water Supply Scheme, or the Goldfields Pipeline. This annual lecture, held by the National Trust, celebrates his legacy. But how big is his legacy? The construction of Fremantle Harbour was probably his greatest personal and technical achievement. Considered opinion at the time was that the harbour should be built further south, as the entrance to the Swan River was blocked by a rocky bar, making the mouth of the river virtually impassable. O'Connor reassessed the available information and convinced Parliament that an inner harbour in the mouth of the river, close to the colony, was feasible. He subsequently blasted and dredged to create a channel and an inner harbour which is still in use today. According to the Fremantle Port Authority, while the harbour has been deepened and facilities modernised and extended over the years, the basic structure of the inner harbour remains essentially unchanged to this day, testament to the boldness, brilliance and foresight of the designer. Over a hundred years later, we are known as an exporting state. Our economy is built predominantly on exports from primary industries, accounting for more than 40% of Australia's overseas trade. Our ports could have been a limiting factor in our success, but Fremantle Harbour has become our largest and busiest general cargo port. Without O'Connor's efforts, our capacity for interstate trade at the end of the last century let alone the development of international trade, would have been compromised right at the outset. The Goldfields pipeline was even more audacious in scope. Gold discoveries in the 1880s and 1890s caused a population explosion in the Western Australian desert, and water was rationed to half a bucket per person per day. In 1896, the then Premier, Sir John Forrest, introduced a bill to the State Parliament to authorise a loan of £2.5 million to construct a pipeline to bring water to the goldfields. The scale of the project was beyond the comprehension of most. It would require construction of the world's longest freshwater pipeline, 530 kilometres of steel pipe carrying 23 cubic metres of water a day, the equivalent of over nine Olympic swimming pools, from a reserve, Mundaring Weir, through eight pumping stations to Kalgoorlie. It was a bold plan, it was considered a risky plan. A loan of £2.5 million had the potential to bankrupt a colony if the gold boom was short-lived. To put those finances into perspective, if you consider the loan as a percentage of the total output of the economy at the time, in today's terms, it would be a loan of roughly $18.7 billion. Through O'Connor's efforts, by 1903, water was flowing into Kalgoorlie. The gold fields boomed, gold continued to drive the state's economy and the population explosion in Kalgoorlie Boulder, plus the availability of water, triggered the expansion of agriculture into the region. The scheme allowed for the development of the gold fields 
and early developments into the wheat belt and the pipeline remains a lifeline to uh, the gold fields. And not only did the scheme allow for these outcomes, the pipeline remains today a lifeline to the gold fields. Both O'Connor and Forrest saw these infrastructure projects within a wider context as part of an integrated plan to support our nascent state's development. The big thinking worked. These infrastructure developments have underpinned the mining, agricultural, industrial, social and economic development of Western Australia. In fact, the physical infrastructure developments themselves are now iconic parts of our cultural heritage. C.Y. O'Connor was undoubtedly a driving force behind these infrastructure developments, but apart from the drive and ability of a person like O'Connor, what else is needed for these bold, future-shaping developments to occur? Truly big picture revolutionary thinking is required. Game changers, future shapers and paradigm shifts don't often occur as a result of incremental change or safely extending what is tried and true. A long-term vision and commitment is needed and this is needed not just from the people undertaking the project but from those supporting and financing it. O'Connor's legacy is a case in point. He was hired by Sir John Forrest, WA's first Premier, who was effectively a patron for his efforts. He commissioned the work, he secured the funding, and he championed the endeavours. O'Connor's major infrastructure works coincided with a very stable 10 years of state administration under Forrest's leadership. Unfortunately for O'Connor, when Forrest withdrew from the state government to enter the first federal parliament in 1901, the subsequent short-lived and unstable state governments put O'Connor's work under attack. Without another champion to defend the pipeline, he was not allowed the space to focus on its completion. He was criticised, defamed, harassed and became depressed, overworked and exhausted. And as we know, he ended his life on the 8th of March 1902, leaving his engineer in chief to see the pipeline through to its successful completion. O'Connor's efforts have been supremely vindicated in hindsight, but all we can do now is to celebrate his legacy. Foreknowledge of a successful outcome is a luxury we never have. Enormous infrastructure projects necessarily require considered risk-taking. They're expensive, they're long-term and they're visionary, and they go beyond the boundaries of what is safe known and tested. To enhance their likelihood of success, it's vital to collaborate with the best and the brightest, the thinkers, the doers, the imaginers, the enablers and the backers. Political and financial commitment, stability and leadership are all crucial. O'Connor's legacy for better and for worse shows us that massive infrastructure projects are much bigger than any one person. This point, I think, is in a sense captured in Tony Jones's 1999 sculpture of C.Y. O'Connor, looking back over his shoulder to uh, Fremantle, approximately 20 metres offshore, to, this, to the area where he committed suicide. And as Bree Blakeman, an anthropologist at ANU, notes, the sculpture, and I quote, evokes a beautiful melancholy that speaks of social isolation and weighted sadness. The world has changed a lot since the early 1900s. Globalism and the digital age are reshaping our society. Unprecedented mobility and co connectivity have fundamentally changed the way society works. Traditional barriers such as distance and language are being eroded. New ideas, resources and markets can be identified and accessed quickly and easily. Just consider apps for mobile phones. Anyone with a good idea can create one and make it available anywhere in the world. Talent, knowledge and capital are increasingly mobile. Governments, institutions and businesses need to be competitive, not just locally but globally. And scientific knowledge is fundamental to the success of our society. From the advances in digital technology and infrastructure to advances in medical science and engineering. 
knowledge assets are becoming the key drivers of success. We like to think of ourselves as a clever country, a phrase obviously made popular by former Prime Minister Bob Hawke. We invented the Hills Hoist, the Victor Lawnmower, the cochlear implant, the black box flight recorder, which of course isn't black at all, and perhaps less noteworthy, the cask wine. <laughs> but 25 years later, Australia is still known primarily for its resource riches, as value-added goods and services make up an ever-increasing fraction of world trade and the relative value of raw materials steadily declines, we run the risk of developing the so-called Dutch disease. This phrase was coined to describe the apparent relationship between the increase in exploitation of natural resources and a decline in the manufacturing sector, exemplified by such a decline that occurred in the Netherlands in the 1960s after the discovery of a major natural gas field. And if you, there's many debates on the Dutch disease, but these data sh across multiple countries essentially show that the greater na uh, natural resource exports are as a share of GDP, the less the uh, growth of manufacturing exports uh, between the period 1970 and 1990. So quite good international data essentially demonstrating the, the Dutch disease. So we risk backing ourselves into an economic and technological corner in this global and digital age if we continue to rely solely on the primary resource exports that have so stunningly delivered over the past century will no doubt be a foundation of our economic uh, success into the future. But we will also have to make the transition to the knowledge-based economy. So what do the massive infrastructure projects of the new knowledge economy look like? What is akin to the, the Goldfields Pipeline and Fremantle Harbour in the 21st century? And what implications do they have for the future of our state and our nation? They are bold, they are cross-disciplinary, and they're based on cutting-edge technologies and concepts. The Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, is one of the global mega science infrastructure projects of the 21st century. And it's happening here in Western Australia. Requiring the ultimate in persistence of vision, it began as a concept in 1991 and won't actually enter its formal construction phase for some years yet. The SKA is a next generation radio telescope, a massive network of linked antennas with a total signal collecting area of one square kilometre. But in many ways, it's much bigger than that. Thousands of antennas will be deployed across Africa and Australia, connected by super high-speed optical fibre, and the data gener generated will be fed into what will be the biggest supercomputer in the world. This billion dollar infrastructure project will be the largest and most international scientific facility that Australia has ever contemplated hosting. The international collaboration required provides both challenges and opportunities that O'Connor never had to consider. The SKA organisation currently has 11 member countries and others may join in the years ahead. But just like the idea of constructing a 530 kilometre water pipeline into the desert over 100 years ago, it's hard to grasp just how big a step forward the SKA technology is and how it will change our scientific, social and economic landscape. So even though the SKA has not entered its formal construction phase, the ramifications of this project are already being felt. The future is now. Three precursor projects, massive and ambitious radio telescopes in their own right, were initiated to develop, test and advance various aspects of the science and technology required to make SKA a reality. They include South Africa's Meerkat, which is currently in construction, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, ASCAP, it's been built already and it's currently being commissioned by CSIRO at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory here in WA. And the third precursor, the Murchison Widefield Array, or MWA, is already operational at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. And this project is being proudly led 
by Curtin University. Its successful launch and operation signalled to the world that radio astronomy research in Australia is world leading. Just like C.Y. O'Connor, we are delivering. Research results from the MWA are already being published in the top scientific journals around the world. The facility will give us, the world, a dramatically improved view of the solar system, explore the period when the first stars and galaxies formed the early universe, search the southern hemisphere sky for old supernova and study our near space weather. Data collected over five years of observations are expected to require 15 petabytes, 15 million gigabytes of storage and archive space. Which brings us to another key stepping stone on the path towards hosting the SKA, demonstrating our ability with the computing infrastructure required to handle the data sets that this radio telescope will produce. In 2009, WA already had a supercomputing hub, IVEC, a joint venture between CSIRO, Curtin, UWA, Murdoch and Edith Cowan. And as part of the bid to host the SKA, the federal government allocated $80 million to IVEC to establish a petascale supercomputing facility. The Pawsey Centre, the most powerful facility of its type in the Southern Hemisphere, was subsequently built in Perth and it's named after another Australian pioneer in this field, CSIRO radio astronomer, Dr Joseph Pawsey. Its operational launch in late 2013 was a significant infrastructure milestone. Supercomputing is now supporting research projects that were impossible dreams only 10 years ago. The Pawsey Centre's ongoing operation and development demonstrates to the world that Australia can deliver and support world-class ICT infrastructure. And it sends a signal to the global research community that those investing in science domains dependent on supercomputing can bring their business to Western Australia. Having benefited from the bold thinking of previous generations, we owe it to future generations to embrace bold projects like the SKA. So what will be the impact of this massive project? Just building it will be a mammoth task involving hundreds of millions of dollars of construction, direct employment, industry involvement and intellectual development. But despite its massive nature, its construction won't inject money into the Australian economy in the way the mining boom has for our state and from our state. The scientific knowledge created by studying the birth and evolution of first ever galaxies, stars and planets 13 million years ago, or testing Einstein's theory of general relativity and extending our understanding of high energy physics, however interesting and important these topics are, they won't measurably impact the life of the man on the street. So why invest in a knowledge infrastructure project? Scientific outcomes are themselves a very good reason, but they take, they occur over long time scales. The precursor telescopes have already pushed the boundaries of conventional radio astronomy. Advances in high performance computing, signal processing, wireless and high speed communications are also occurring. Engineering solutions for low cost, high performance antennas and related hardware have already been explored. And the computing challenges produced by the very high data rates and volumes and large-scale data archives are being addressed. So this sort of technology is important for the SKA itself, but it also transfers directly to a wide range of down-to-earth applications like personal computing, telecommunications, wireless technologies. The development of Wi-Fi is a classic case. We all rely on it. The key patents enabling the technology were actually developed by an Australian radio astronomer, John O'Sullivan, working for CSIRO during the last major phase of radio astronomy research. The bottom line is that the spin-offs from major scientific endeavours to other areas of science and industry can completely transform technologies and economies. The novel and cutting-edge technologies developed for the uh, MWA and eventually the SKA 
will have applications far beyond radio astronomy. The infrastructure, particularly around supercomputing, is already supporting a whole range of research. For instance, allowing us to study diseases from asthma to Alzheimer's in ways we were never able to before, produce better techniques and tools for mineral exploration, to allow us to develop renewable energy solutions, and even to help us conserve and interpret the World War II shipwreck sites of HMAS Sydney and HSK Coolmarin. Solutions to a range of problems are being explored that all will have social, environmental and economic benefits. Massive infrastructure projects like the SKA also provide a focal point for upskilling the population. A renewed focus on the origins of the universe in the public consciousness has the potential, I hope, to again make children look upwards and consider more distant horizons, much as they did during the space race in the 1960s. A telescope that straddles the uh, planet and a supercomputer that can download the equivalent of the entire internet in five minutes should fire the ambitions of a new generation and increase the uptake of science, technology, engineering and mathematics, so STEM study, through all levels of education. International research indicates that 75% of the fastest growing occupations require STEM skills and knowledge. Employment in STEM occupations is projected to grow at almost twice the pace of other occupations. And a STEM skilled workforce is critical for our continued productivity and global positioning. However, problematic in light of some of those projections is the fact that the Chamber of Commerce and Industry's recent State of the Future report asserts that WA's rate of tertiary attainment is currently lower than the OECD average and indeed doesn't compare well at a national level, encouraging the next generation once again to reach for the stars can only be a good thing. For those who've completed their formal technical education, a project the size of the SKA attracts the best and the brightest, both nationally and internationally. When I talk to the young researchers who are working on our SKA project, and they're from all over the world, I say, why are you here? Why have you come to Perth? They just look at me and say, we're here because of the science. The technically challenging nature of the project has required and will continue to require strategic collaboration between the world's leading astronomers engineers and scientists, and much of their focus will be here in Australia. But beyond scientists and engineers, the project will help attract and develop some of the new type of professionals that will be needed to help drive the knowledge economy of the future. Across the world, 7,500 companies are currently hiring data scientists, employees specifically skilled in dealing with big data and the analysis of trends in data data mining, extracting business intelligence that translates into growth of profit, telling us through Amazon what books we might like to read based on things that we've read in the past and based on the preferences of people like us. The number of data scientist jobs being advertised has increased 25% over the last 12 months. Described by the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago as the sexiest job of the 21st century, a new job for mathematicians, think of him or her as a hybrid of a data hacker, an analyst, a communicator and trusted advisor. The combination is extremely powerful and very rare. <coughs> There's a growing realisation that the future economy will be driven by big data as it's never been before, requiring a highly skilled and multidisciplinary workforce that is comfortable crossing the boundaries between academia and industry. As a recent article in the influential German Das Spiegel noted, entitled the article Living by Numbers, Big no Data Knows What Your Future Holds, it concluded in many places the mantra of data is extolled as the new oil or gold of the 21st century. How do you find the value in enormous data sets that allows you to do something that your competitors can't do? How do you mine the data for that 1% productivity gain? 
in a number of industries that Australia and WA are heavily reliant on, as these GE projections show, a 1% productivity gain will equate to hundreds of millions of dollars in savings. As our ability to produce and analyse more data improves, so will our productivity and our global position. Infrastructure projects like the SKA go even further than the role they play in attracting individuals. They stimulate partnerships between organisations across government, academia and industry. Collaboration is vital to the development of a strong innovation culture and a vibrant innovation ecosystem. It's the key driver for a robust knowledge economy. Sharing information and skills across disciplines is where technologies combine and new ideas and applications are born. Cross-fertilisation of ideas can lead to advances in very surprising areas. The current generation of massive infrastructure projects will foster innovation just by bringing together experts from a range of different fields and giving them some very challenging problems to think about together. But they have the potential to go further by bringing together universities, research agencies and industry. As Minister McFarlane has clearly articulated, Australia needs to improve its capacity to translate research into commercial outcomes. We've historically lagged behind our international counterparts in research industry collaboration. We perform very well in research excellence. We punch well above our weight, but we perform very poorly in translating publicly funded research into commercial reality. To quote some of the very sobering statistics outlined in the discussion paper released from <coughs> Minister McFarlane's office late last year, we rank 29th and 30th of, uh, out of 30 OECD countries on the proportion of large businesses and small to medium enterprises collaborating with public research institutions, way down there at the bottom. The proportion of Australian researchers working in business is significantly lower in Australia than in other countries. And probably the most staggering uh, observation of the report is that the majority of patents filed in Australia in 2012 were filed by non-residents. The current environment is ripe to address these failings. Internationally, we know that innovation flourishes in locations where industry and academia come together. For instance, building on its proximity to the University of Cambridge, the Cambridge Science Park has attracted 1,400 firms, they employ over 53,000 people, and the turnover is £13 billion, uh, 13 billion pounds a year. And more recently, the UK Catapult program has been established as a network of focused and elite technology and innovation centres that are designed to facilitate the rapid transformation of research fi findings into commercial outcomes. Already showing evidence of success, they provide what the original proposer, Dr Herman Hauser, referred to as translational infrastructure infrastructure to bridge the gap between research and commercial outcomes. We have the opportunity to make Perth the next recognised international hub for big data and innovation. We are building translational infrastructure here and it will be built around the biggest data application currently in existence, the SKA and the Pawsey Centre. An initiative that may grow to meet this challenge is the Exascale Data and Alliance, the EDA. It's an industry-led initiative to bring together academia, industry and government agencies in a Perth-based hub here at Curtin University, motivated by the academic and commercial challenges of big data. While we may not be able to replicate the Silicon Valley phenomenon or the Cambridge Science Park uh, success overnight, improving the interface between business and universities in the current environment will drive the transition from traditional university campuses to integrated innovation precincts. And this model underpins our plan for this campus, of which you've all found yourself here today, um, 
and transform it into something that not only provides education and the skills for the future, but also brings together researchers and industry around key areas of innovation. In the 1890s, it would have been hard for, for most people to envision how a harbour, a rail network and a pipeline would shape the development of our state and change the face of our society. The impacts of massive scientific infrastructure projects like the SKA are e equally hard to visualise why they're important. Returns to society from investment in research generally occurs over decades, it's not easy to explain, and it can occur in seemingly unrelated areas. But the SKA will drive technological developments worldwide, and investment in the SKA project and in the stepping stones towards it is an investment in our future. The skills, capabilities and institutions necessary to make it a success are increasingly the same skills, capabilities and institutions necessary to ensure that we remain competitive as a nation and at the forefront of a global knowledge economy. Our ability to self-source and leverage this research capacity will directly impact on our culture of innovation, our productivity, our security, our living standards, our education and employment opportunities, and our social and environmental performance. So I'd argue that the opportunity is here now for Australia to create a global high technology niche and benefit from everything that flows from it. To do so will require not only the vision and courage of individuals like C.Y. O'Connor, but the leadership and willingness to support the champion and champion the big ideas of the future. Question is, are we visionary enough and bold enough to do this? The SKA project has had strong bipartisan support over many years from both state and national governments. That demonstrates that we can do it. But the challenge is to ensure that we keep our focus not only on the short term and the medium term, but on the long term and ensuring that we leverage off major infrastructure projects of the future and the present, they're happening now, to ensure that we position and the state appropriately for future growth and uh, reputation. And uh, I thank the National Trust for the invitation to present the lecture. I thank uh, Kitty Drock for her excellent research and support, and I hope that's been of some interest. Thank you very much. <laughs>